Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week on the Garden DC podcast, we're joined by Peggy Cornett. She's Monticello's historic gardener and curator of plants. She's also a researcher, author, editor, international lecturer, and educator. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Peggy, you're down in Charlottesville, Virginia. How is the weather down there this week? Well, it's been hot Uh, for quite a while, up in the 90s. Um, But today is overcast and rather cool, and we may have some rain. So we've had periodic rains um, throughout the month. So it's it's, uh, not not been as dry as it usually can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much the same here in the the D.C. suburbs. We're having a nice light rain today for once, not a gully washer. (laughs) That's always good. And I know Monticello uh, means little mountain, and it literally is a little mountain because when you're on the top of it, sometimes the the weather up there can be completely different than down below. I I recall some past Heritage Harvest Festivals uh, where I had to wear gloves in the first week of September because my hands were freezing off. (laughs) Yes, it can be very unpredictable, uh, especially coming up in the fall, but... um... Yeah, Jefferson once wrote that on the on top of Monticello, you look down into the workhouse of nature. And so, um, you know, we can have just about anything. And sometimes I'll drive into work and it's perfectly clear in Charlottesville and I'll get halfway up the mountain and we're just uh, socked in, in in fog. So it's it's definitely a, a different climate sometimes. Yeah, I do recall some of the, the fog sitting in the fog up there and waiting for that to clear but that creates a, a nice microclimate for growing. And I imagine that when Thomas Jefferson scouted out the location to, to put Monticello, that was obviously a big factor. Absolutely. He was very cognizant of the, of the uh, climate at, at Monticello and also um, the, the way in which the garden was facing. He uh, situated the vegetable garden in a, in a very ideal location on the southeast slope of the mountain so that he could capture, you know, the extend the seasons uh, in both directions. Um, we really avoid a lot of the late spring freezes and, and early frosts in, in the fall. And uh, we're probably almost a, a full zone warmer in the vegetable garden because of, of its location. It's protected from the north winds um, because it is uh, down the slope slightly from the top of the mountain. And uh, that southeast exposure um, is is really quite quite ideal for growing a vegetable garden for long seasons. Of course, it's very hot in the summer. Oh yeah, I was going to say it's also very exposed to the sun in the summertime, so it does make it really hot on that side. It can be brutal. Yes, you're right. <laughs> but you do have that little um, brick tower in the middle, and I'm just blanking on the name of it, and that's kind of provides a little bit of shade. Right. It's a garden pavilion. Uh, Jefferson called it a temple in the garden, and it's a, it's a, it's really a beautiful um, structure. It, we reconstructed it from the original, which was destroyed in a storm toward the end of Jefferson's lifetime. But the pavilion actually stands at the midpoint of the thousand foot long vegetable garden terrace. So um, you're you're at the five hundred foot point of the vegetable garden, and um, it's a cube. It's twelve and a half by twelve and a half by twelve and a half. Uh, feet, which is pretty neat, and it has uh, it's a it's a lovely s- structure. It's a place where Jefferson was. Um, it was said that he would go there and sit and read and observe, um, you know, his his garden and the orchards below. And uh, you can see about forty miles from that location um, toward the the Piedmont of Virginia. So, and today we're very lucky to still have a very uninter- uninterrupted view from that point. Uh, there are no cities or tall buildings or anything that have come up or developments even. So it's, it's very rural in that, in that location. It's quite lovely. Some visitors call the view from there, the sea view. Some people called it his sea view. It's like you're looking out over the ocean. 
<laughs> I don't think we could quite see that far, but there's some, yeah, beautiful rolling hills in the distance. And I've taken some really nice photos from that vantage point, but I can, I can see why he picked that midway point. It's a, it's a really nice resting spot. And that does bring up a good point that a lot of us don't put a place to sit and enjoy in our edible gardens. Um, you know, you might have a bench or two in your ornamental, but usually there's no place to rest or sit or just even take notes in your edible landscape. That's an excellent point. And um, I believe that the the garden pavilion was a place for Jefferson to take notes and, and because he did keep a garden book uh, throughout his lifetime and, and um, wrote down, uh, documented uh, what was in the garden. He kept lists and diagrams and, um, uh, he was really writing in this garden book from the time he was uh, in his early 20s until he was uh, two years before his death in 1824 was the last entry. But um, yeah, I think having a place to sit is so important um, just to you know take it all in. Mm -hmm. And so lucky to have that type of record keeping to as a resource for today's gardeners and for obviously historical purposes in the garden. And before we dive into that a little more, let's talk about your background, Peggy. What made you a plant person? <laughs> well, I always give my mother credit. Um, she was uh, really into vegetable gardening, and as a young child, I was I, got, I was involved with her her half acre garden in our backyard, and uh, she grew up on a farm and was very, you know, a self-sufficient farm actually in, in West Virginia. So she was um, just kind of a, uh, a vernacular gardener in many ways. She had some very interesting uh, ways of keeping birds out of the garden by um, hanging pie tins in the trees and that sort of thing. And um, But she was um, really well known for her ability to to grow a lot of vegetables. So I grew up with that. And then um, when I went to college, to uh, I decided to go to Chapel Hill in, in North Carolina, UNC Chapel Hill. And I wanted to study horticulture, but they didn't have a horticulture degree. Um, so I studied botany and I did a dual major in botany and English. And I think that was a terrific background um, for my career because I ended up, I really love botany. I love native plants and um, the study of taxonomy and um, uh, field botany basically is what I'm most uh, attracted to. And of course, ecology and that, you know, was during the uh, environmental movement. So it was an important time um, in my life to really learn about nature. And um, from there, I went to, uh, I worked at a private, uh, well, I worked at Old Salem in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is a restored Moravian village. Um, it's a, it's quite an interesting uh, pl place. It's a, a really covers a, about a hundred years of, of settlement in, in Winston-Salem. And I worked there for a year and that's where I got interested in garden history. And I was actually a gardener there, but also a, a costume interpreter in the garden, which was kind of fun. And um, I learned a lot about, um, you know, what's involved with garden interpretation and, and garden research. So after that, I worked for another couple of years in a private estate, um, the Haynes uh, <clears throat> family estate, which Haynes Hose Company. <laughs> I worked for the matriarch and uh, she had a beautiful um, garden that was des designed by Ellen Biddle Shipman in the early 20th century. So again, this was, was a, uh, a more recent historic garden in a sense. And um, so I was introduced to, to that a period of gardening, um, you know, the uh, country life in America kind of period of gardening. And so then that once, um, from there, I, I was so lucky to get a scholarship to um, go to the University of Delaware and the Longwood graduate program. So that's where I really focused on garden history, the history of, of annual flowers. Um, that's what I wrote my thesis on. And um, it was eventually published in, into a book uh, by Dumbarton Oaks. Uh, it's called Popular Annuals of Eastern North America. So, um, and so the rest is kind of history. I go on from there to work at Oak Alley Plantation for a couple of years. Um, when I was finishing my 
graduate thesis, um, the director of the this historic house, uh, this ho- historic plantation on the banks of the Mississippi River, was looking for someone to be the the director of gardens there. So I took this job, which was uh, quite a quite an experience working with three hundred year old live oak trees and you know lots of uh, grass uh, that grows. Uh, you know, every five days you have to cut and just a very lush landscape. So that was um, shortly before, after that, I, I was able to come to Monticello. I started working at Monticello in 1983. So um, I've been here for 37 years. Yeah. Where I've ended up landing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I'm glad you found your home and that's quite an experience and background, but I love the turn of phrase vernacular gardener. I'm going to have to adopt that. Maybe make a couple of t-shirts and say, I'm a vernacular gardener. (laughs) (laughs) I just love that. Um, So with starting at Monticello uh, 37 years ago, how has it changed? How has the visitor experience changed? Yeah, Monticello has gone through a, a lot of evolution uh, since I've been there. Uh, when I first started, we had just uh, completed, they had just completed the restoration of the vegetable garden terrace. And that was all really based on um, archaeological investigation. They had, uh, we knew Jefferson wrote about the garden, but we, it, everything was verified by archaeology. So it was one of the first and kind of premier landscape restorations that was really based on on this um, scientific study. And um, so our first um, efforts when I started in 83, uh, we were really looking for historic varieties to return to the vegetable garden. Um, We were bringing back a lot of heirloom um, crops and uh, we you know, looked far and wide from different his, um, historic seed companies and, and fruit growers, as well as um, from Seed Savers Exchange, which was um, which was an organization that started in the, in the mid-1970s and is still going, it's quite a, a, a vibrant organization today. Um, we went to National Seed Storage Laboratories, where um, seeds are kept in cold storage for for the future, and um, that's where we got our tennis ball lettuce, for example. And so, um, a lot of our emphasis was returning historic crops to Monticello. And we also, um, of course, had a restored flower garden that the Garden Club of Virginia um, uh, established or you know recreated in the 1940s. And we've certainly maintained that, even though it's not probably exactly as archaeologically based. Um, garden, but it is a garden that reflects Jefferson's ornamental landscape. Um, I think garden interpretation has evolved a great deal since uh, I started. Um, uh, we've we've done a great deal of research into the um, uh, enslaved um, people who lived at Monticello and worked at Monticello, and we, we've learned so much in the last 25 to 30 years um, about their lives. Um, we've had a program called um, getting word that um, is has been focused on tracking down dis- descendants of the enslaved who lived at Monticello and uh, getting their stories. The many um, oral histories are 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 have been recorded through this this um, research, and it's it's remarkable how much we've learned. Uh, and also um, studying just the the. The writings from the period, um, you know, before we would just talk about, you know, the slaves did this or that, but we didn't have names to people, and now we, we, we've learned more about their skills and their, um, their life history and how they were associated with Jefferson, um, and uh, we we try to t- bring those stories to life, and um, you know, it's 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 a uh, it's these are difficult subjects, and it's often not easy to to explain. Um, what the life was like in that, in those days. But, um, it was certainly, um, I think very important for us to really reveal the, the landscape of slavery, as well as just talking about Jefferson and his love of flowers and vegetables. Um, so, um, our interpretation, this is really a broad based, um, interpretation, not just with the gardens, but also, um, the house, uh, the house tour really incorporates a lot 
of this theme. And we even have an entire tour called Slavery at Monticello, which um, takes place on Mulberry Row. And this is considered Monticello's main street. It's right above the vegetable garden. And so this tour um, is an incredibly well attended. People are, are, are quite interested in, in learning about this. And uh, so uh, we've even um, reconstructed some of the um, buildings on Mulberry Row. Uh, including uh, the Hemmings cabin, uh, where John and Priscilla Hemmings lived, and a cabin that was used for uh, iron rods and uh, um, storage for um, iron that was used to make nails and that sort of thing at Monticello. So um, we're, it's ongoing, but it's, it's an exciting time for Monticello, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad to see those important stories being told and so much more research being done lately. And it's up front and central as part of the Monticello education experience. Yes, we um, we had a project called the, the Mountaintop Project in which we were able to restore the final um, section of the connection of Mulberry Road to the All Weather Passage and the South Kitchen. Uh, before that, um, when you were at uh, just near the house, near the terraces, you really even couldn't see Mulberry Row in many ways, and and you never saw the connection of the kitchen to the vegetable garden and to the the uh, enslaved who lived and worked on that site. So there's been a lot of transition in in the um, in the uh, landscape of Monticello and of course, as well as in the house. So um, uh, this has uh, been ongoing, but we've restored some of the rooms under the South Terrace, uh, including um, a room dedicated to the Getting Word Project. And then another room that's uh, interpreting um, the life of, of, of Sally Hemmings, which uh, is, is a very powerful um, exhibit in there as well. Mm. And I know that you have a newish visitor center experience. So those who haven't visited Monticello in, you know, a decade or more should definitely come back um, and see that new entranceway and the native gardens that are situated around it. And it's just a beautifully constructed building. And am I correct that it's LEED certified? That's right. It's, it's gold LEED certified. Um, the, the uh, uh, visitor center, um, um, opened in 2009, and it was, uh, it's a, as I said, a gold lead certified um, structure. So it, um, it is using all local um, building materials, stone, wood. Um, it has uh, three green roofs. Um, the, the courtyard where you first enter with large trees and everything is really, uh, it's all growing in three feet of soil. And below it is the, um, there it's the, uh, the, the inner workings of the, of the structure. It's, it's, um, uh, a, uh, classrooms are, are under this, uh, this courtyard and, and they're all kind of buried into the ground. Um, it's a, a geothermal, uh, heating and cooling, uh, the water that runs off the roofs are funneled into a um, uh, a, a greenway. Um, they're they're channeled underground, and then they kind of emerge, and it's a like a little stream that runs through the center of the of the of the of the parking lot. And there are native plants all around that, and of course, all the plants around um, the visitor center are um, native. Um, and some large trees were brought in to make it appear as if the, the uh, building is, was just always there. But um, so it had a mature landscape planted pretty quickly around the building. So it's definitely a, um, was a masterpiece in my mind of, and a, a great transition from what we previously had, which was kind of an open air uh, pavilion where people bought tickets and got on a bus. <laughs> so now it's, it's, an, it's a much nicer experience. So, yeah. And we even have a gardener. We have a native plant gardener who, are, who works there full time in in that area because um, we have so many native plantings there and um, all through the uh, all through the parking lot area are, are also native trees and and um, perennials and shrubs. Yeah. Yeah, I can't help thinking that were Thomas Jefferson alive today, that he would be adapting all of these latest uh, building techniques, and he would be definitely at the forefront of uh, green building phenomenon. Yeah, you know, well, it's interesting because even 
even at Monticello, he, he incorporated skylights in the house. The, um, the, you know, the natural lighting in the house is, is remarkable. And he, he was using things like what we would call storm doors or windows. And um, uh, so there, there were techniques, I, you know, it's probably not in, in for the same reasons we do these things today, but there, there were many elements of the house that, that made a lot of sense. And, you know, channeling the um, rainwater from the house, he, he channeled the rainwater into Philadelphia gutters that then ran into four cisterns at the corners of the terraces. So he was trying to save the rainwater to use it for the garden and for, you know, consumption. Um, the cisterns would, would leak, so they weren't that, that um, successful, but um, it was a very um, well thought out uh, uh, architectural design plan to incorporate these cisterns that you really don't even know they're there. I mean, they're built into the the ground and and the, you, you, you don't even see gutters coming off the house because they're internal, so. Hmm. Yeah, I, I never noticed the, gu- the gutters on the house, but I knew that there were cisterns underneath. And one, as a gardener, notices, especially on the vegetable terrace, that all the water has to be hand brought in that there's he obviously didn't have an irrigation system and that there the stream is at the bottom of the mountain so to speak so everything had to be brought up that wasn't rainwater yeah the ravana river is about a mile away and it's down at the bottom of the mountain um so i believe there were times when the garden could get quite dry um in drought periods uh there are springs around the mountain and jefferson knew where they were and um the, of course, the enslaved would, would take wagons down to these springs and collect rainwater, collect the, the water from them. Well, there was one that was fairly close to the top of the mountain called the North Spring. But again, it's, it, this is a, a really an, a, an onerous um, labor to haul water up. And it must have been quite difficult to keep plants alive when we have our regular drought periods, which, which often happen. He did have a plan, though, at one point. One point he wanted to uh, create. Uh, there were, there were, you know, the Montalto, the big mountain above Monticello. Is co- he called it Montalto, and it apparently had a natural spring. And so there was at one point during his uh, musings, he was thinking of uh, creating a waterfall from that spring that you would see from the west lawn of Monticello. But then he wanted to channel that waterfall over to his gardens with a series of aqueducts. And so um, this was all just kind of in his mind and on paper, but he never realized it. But, you know, it was, it's kind of an amazing um, thought, you know, that, that he was con- contemplating a way in which he could resolve the problems with, with uh, watering his garden in, in such a, a beautiful fashion <laughs> if it, it could have been done. That would have been beautiful, but yes, very ambitious. <laughs> and, um, so for the circle of annual flowers that are around the walk uh, at Monticello, most of those are heirloom or all of those are from heirloom? And are they all grown from seed or are some of them started seedlings? Um all, all across the board, um, the the winding walk uh, that runs around the uh, leveled west lawn. It's it's um, uh, a very uh, meandering walk with narrow uh, borders uh, on either side, and um, we're growing. Well, there are perennials there, um, some peonies and um, echinacea and things like that. But for the most part, especially at this time of year, the main um, visual you see there um, are the summer annuals. And most of them are either grown from, um, you know, grown in a greenhouse. We do have production greenhouses at Monticello that are off uh, the public view. But um, a lot of them also just come up from seed every year. And uh, the flower gardener, um, Debbie Donnelly, is um, very uh, observant of what's coming up in the garden. And she'll thin things out so that, um, for example, we have full beds of, um, like, snow on the mountain and... um, we have a uh, sensitive plant that, and other flowers that have come up that are annuals that come up year after year, and they, they've just reseeded themselves. And so um, it, it's a mixture. But they're heirloom plants. Um, most of them are, are flowers we've had for years. It's a mixture of um, ornamental flowers. Uh, a lot of them are just species. 
um, that uh, flowers that were popular in Jefferson's day. Of course, he recorded m many of them that were growing. But we also grow a lot of, of native plants in the garden, probably about 100 different species of native uh, of wildflowers are, are grown in the garden. Um, cardinal flower is one of our favorites and, and the great blue lobelia. Um, so, uh, and again, those are perennials that come, come back year after year. We even have a beautiful bed of um, bloodroot that comes, that flowers in the springtime. It's just really spectacular in the garden more so. And, and um, Virginia bluebell is another flower that uh, Jefferson observed when he was a young man uh, growing on the slopes of Monticello. And and uh, we have beds of that in the in the garden today, and, and that's just a beautiful time of year in the spring. Uh, we also grow a lot of bulbs, and um, we're hoping we can replant bulbs again this this fall. And Jefferson grew tulips and hyacinths and daffodils and uh, lilies and fritillarias and that sort of thing. So uh, the springtime is also um, very popular in the garden for these these wonderful, beautiful, colorful bulbs that are in bloom. And where was he sourcing uh, back in the day, especially for all those bulbs? Yeah, he um, did have sources. Um, various people, uh, nurserymen like uh, Bernard McMahon was one of his major sources of seeds and bulbs um, and plants. Uh, he, he had a nursery and seed house in Philadelphia. And Bernard McMahon was um, um, pretty well known uh, as as an author as well, he wrote the American Gardener's Calendar, and it was first published in 1806. And and McMahon um, wisely, I think, sent Jefferson a copy of his book that first year it was published. And so Jefferson, at the time, was um, planning his retirement garden. He was still president in 1806, but um, he was obviously um, referring to McMahon's book because often. Uh, Jefferson had directions in his notes to his memoranda to his overseer and to his granddaughters that were sort of word from word out of McMahon's book on planting um, bulbs and flowers. And McMahon was sending Jefferson some unusual tulips, for example, and and he was sending him seeds of lots of uh, flowers. And so he um, he was one of his main sources, but he also was getting plants from um, uh, nurserymen in in um, in Washington, for example, uh, the Thomas Maine Nursery out of Washington, uh, D.C., where, where he was president. And uh, so when he retired in 1809, um, a lot of uh, the flowers were, were um, already being planted in the garden. He also um, was receiving um, seeds and from uh, people from abroad, uh, for example, Andre Touin, who was the superintendent of the gardens at the uh, Botanical Garden in Paris, was sending huge amounts of packages of seeds and, and plants from all over the world to Jefferson almost every year. So, um, in fact, he was sending so much uh, material that Jefferson was sharing it with his friends because he wasn't able to, you know, deal with it all. But um, he was very generous uh, in sending Jefferson. And um, Jefferson had great friendships with um, gardeners all over. Another source of, of seeds and plants for Jefferson were, were his neighbors. Um, uh, uh, George Divers, who lived at Farmington, which is now a country club today, he was uh, quite an excellent gardener and was able to provide seeds for Jefferson, um, mostly of vegetables. When Jefferson wasn't able, when they weren't able to save certain crops in the garden um, every year, and um, people such as uh, John Hartwell Cock at Bremo Plantation uh, provided. Uh, seeds and crops to Jefferson as well. So there was quite a neighborhood of, of, um, of uh, gardeners who, who shared with, with Jefferson and he shared with them as well. And I imagine there was a lot of, of course, seed saving done from year to year in the garden itself. Very, very important. Yes. And of course, we're still doing that today, just as they did in Jefferson's day. But um, there's, there's quite a bit of, um, uh, information in Jefferson's garden book and in his letters where he talks about um, certain crops failed or we weren't able to collect seed this year. And, and so he was asking um, for um, to replace for replacement crops from his friends. And and um, uh, yeah, seed saving was uh, critical, of course, year after year. And for us today to preserve a lot of these heirloom varieties, it's it's a very important exercise. I mean, we're already saving seed 
now and uh, we'll be saving seed of <clears throat> over the course of the next few months of a lot of of crops especially um tomatoes and and beans and so forth peas and in the flower gardens um again we're saving uh, some very unusual uh, species flowers that we grow, such as the single-flowered African marigold, and um, you know, of course, we s- save the popular coxcomb seed and um, love lies bleeding and uh, Peruvian zinnias and uh, different flowers like that. And uh, of course, when we had our Heritage Har- Harvest Festival, seed saving was was even a workshop that we offered every year for uh, during that program as well and I think you attended some of those <laughs> yes <laughs> I was happy to be a past speaker at the at the festival and to be able to attend was such a treat to be able to walk around and have that seed saving in person um, demonstration around the garden was fabulous and then there's of course your gift shop which also sells some of the seeds from saved from the garden Mm-hmm. That's right. We have a, a large display of seeds that we that we collect and package here at, on site, and um, you can certainly um, go to our uh, online catalog and buy seeds uh, year round uh, from the from Monticello. Just go to monticello.org and look for the shop section, and you'll find a, a great selection of of all our our, our flower vegetable. Um, herb seeds um, online as well. So definitely uh, a great resource for for our gardening friends out there in the world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I do recall a few stories of Jefferson's gardening that he would have competition for the first pea, I think, of the season. And then for the tallest, is it sunflower? I can't remember if it was sunflower or not. Well, there was that the, the pea contest is probably the most famous uh, that Jefferson participated in, and it was with his ne- in the neighborhood. Um, so his friends were encouraged to see who could bring the first win- the first dish of English pea to table in the springtime, and the winner would would host a dinner with all the neighbors um, to come and enjoy this this uh, to feast on the peas, and also probably a, a, a very uh, lavish dinner. And, um, you know, you would think Jefferson would win this contest every year because of the, the situation of his garden. Um, he was starting to he'd start planting peas sometimes in late February, early March, really getting it in the ground early. As, according to his garden book, uh, that's when a lot of this activity would start. But it turns out that um, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, George Divers of uh, Farmington, w- was probably a better gardener in some ways. And somehow he was always winning this contest every year. Um, and so it's a delightful story though, that one year, one year Jefferson actually did win it. And um, his, he was encouraged to announce this to all the neighbors. And he said, oh no, just let Mr. Divers win it again, because you know I don't want to take his glory away from him. So he was kind of being a magnanimous about it, but uh, you know, he didn't, uh, I'm sure it was just a, a great celebration every spring. And as you can imagine, and maybe he didn't want to take on the hosting. Oh, I won't go that far, but yeah, you probably. Um, I'm not sure how many people participated in it, but it could have been a big crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Was there a, a favorite flower that Jefferson liked to bring to table, maybe as a cutting flower? Well, um, that's a good question. I, you know, he he did grow a wide variety. There were, I think, his granddaughters were very interested in flowers. Um, in the gardens as well. And so there's a lot of documentation about the excitement over the tulips when they first flowered in the springtime. And tulips are mentioned quite a lot, but there's also mention of flowers like the the, the caracalla bean, which is the snail vine. Um, Jefferson wrote that it's the most beautiful bean in the world. So he obviously liked that flower. Um, he also liked the heliotrope. He said that the smell rewards the care. It's the fragrant heliotrope is is one of the flowers that we enjoy growing every year. We just grow the, the species form, the wild form that grows from, it's uh, native to Peru, Peru, I believe, or South America. Um, you know, he was growing uh, um, African marigolds and um, and uh, some of those flowers that are also from South, South America. Um, so yeah, I think, it probably like most of us, he, he might have enjoyed flowers as they 
they were in season, so to speak, um, just the same as, as the vegetables. Um, for example, he was growing a, 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 an army captain from San Antonio, Texas, sent Jefferson a, a pepper one year, um, the, which we call the Texas bird pepper. It's, it's really grows wild down in, in um, the southern part of the United States down into Mexico. And it's a very hot pepper. I believe they call it chilo in in Texas. It's uh, it we call it a bird pepper because it's so hot that only birds can eat it because <laughs> birds don't have this the sense of taste that tastes the heat in a pepper. But it's a very it's a very pretty little pepper. It's it's almost decorative in the garden, and so um, it's one of our favorites. Um, and it's one that Jefferson was growing because he he was hoping to have a pepper that was hardier that could withstand some of the, the early frosts that, you know, most peppers succumb to. And it is a pretty, pretty, yeah. pretty tough pepper. Yeah. He, he was also growing uh, or trying to grow, uh, cultivate some of the crops that Lewis and Clark brought back from, from uh, the West when they were on their journey from um, uh, 1803 to 1806. Um, the Lewis and Clark expedition was intended to, um, you know, uh, travel across the continent to map uh, and um, uh, make observations of, of the landscape and to return uh, plants and and seeds of of uh, any kind of economic crops that they could find as well as ornamentals. And um, so they did bring back some um, uh, beans, for example. The Arikara bean was one that Jefferson um, had planted and cultivated in the garden for a few years. And um, and we have a number of these uh, Lewis and Clark associated crops in the garden today that um, are very popular and very interesting to tell people about, you know, the differences and, and the types of crops that Native Americans were growing from North Dakota. <laughs> and I do um, recall reading in uh, Andrea Wolf's founding gardener's book um, that he had a little bit of a rivalry with um, some of the other founding members um just for i guess bragging rights about some of the new introductions to the garden uh for do you have an example um i'm trying to think what she mentioned um you know like jefferson you know a lot of people want to say he introduced tomatoes to the gardening but you know that wasn't really true i mean he was an early um he he documented tomatoes and they were grown in, in the vegetable garden at Monticello beginning in 1809, but there were other people growing tomatoes, um, in Virginia, um, and, uh, many years before that. Um, and of course, um, he, uh, he was very interested in, in fruits as well. And, uh, he had a, an enormous fruit a fruit garden on the south slope of the vegetable you know, of the of the of Monticello, just below the vegetable garden terrace. And there, uh, there were probably a thousand trees at its height of, of cult cultivation. Then, in his lifetime, and probably around 1812 was a, a, a huge year for the fruit garden. He once wrote that the um, we abound in the luxury of the peach, and so he loved. I think he had about 30 different varieties of peach trees growing in the. In the orchard there and um, apples as well and figs um, figs were important in the garden and he was very proud to be able to bring figs to table because it's not easy to grow figs in um, in central Virginia and they were protected of course by uh, the vegetable garden wall which is, is uh, uh, in some points it's over 10 feet and it was a, a massive stone wall that supported the terrace so he was growing figs that were brought back from France, for example, the Marseille fig. And um, there were other fruits in the garden, such as um, peaches, um, apples, cherries, pears, plums, apricots, nectarines, um, raspberries, gooseberries, and currants. And of course, he tried, uh, he wanted to grow the European grape and to produce his own wine, but uh, we don't believe he ever succeeded in producing wine. Um, Although there were several attempts and a number of failures um, in his uh, in his vineyard, so that's something that uh, we've re recreated the vineyard, but we've tried to be successful with it by grafting the the grapes onto our uh, the European grape onto our our domestic wild grape, which helps ensure its its vigor and vitality. Because the European grape is a kind of a 
a sensitive, uh, shallow-rooted grape, and it succumbs to droughts and diseases um, that, especially that they encountered in, when they were grown in the soils of, of North America. So our native grape is very tough and resilient and deep-rooted, and um, and so using that as an understock is what vintners do all over the world now. Uh, these are domestic grapes. And the apple trees he he was growing were those grafted or were those on their own rootstock? Um, I believe they were they were budded or grafted. Yes. Uh huh. And uh, again, there you know the varieties of apples uh, have dwindled in uh, in the last two hundred years. But in Jefferson's day, there were hundreds of different varieties of of apples. You know that were useful for for everything from you know um, eating out of hand to um, making cider, uh, to cooking, um, to preserving, drying. Um, so it seemed like every apple had its own use. And uh, um, cider was, of course, very important as well at Monticello and cider making. There was an entire cider um, orchard on the north slope of the mountain on the opposite side of the vegetable garden. And today we have the predominant tree in that orchard is the, the Hughes crab, which was uh, a, a cider apple that we were able to reintroduce um, after it was uh, dis- rediscovered near Williamsburg. And um, it was one of Jefferson's favorite cider apples. Yeah, we, we still haven't found the Tolliver apple. So if anyone knows that one, um, it's a, it's, it was, he said it was the finest cider. I believe that's the one he said produced uh, cider like silky champagne. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that would be lovely to rediscover. Yeah. <laughs> Can you describe a typical work day for you? I know you wear many hats at Monticello. Well, you know, the, the, well, my rec, my uh, schedule is not very typical nowadays because of the uh, COVID pandemic. And so we are, um, a lot of us are working uh, remotely and I do work from home uh, many days, but I, when I go in, I'm, um, I'm able to, you know, I do, I do a lot of research. I, I have, I keep plant records and, um, um, but I also spend time in the garden and, um, just, um, sometimes I'll, uh, I can work in the garden, of course, but also just spend time with the gardeners and discussing, um, you know, how, uh, the gardens are, you know, our plans for the future of the garden, what will be growing in the fall, for example, some new, new, uh, crops or flowers that we'll have. Um, I also, uh, am involved with garden interpretation. So a part of my job was, um, training guides and, observing their their tours and so uh, actually when I was first hired back in 1983 one of my my first job was to um, start a garden tour program and so um, I was involved with that um, for about 10 years before I switched jobs and went to the Center for Historic Plants and and that that's a whole different program that's going on at Tufton Farm and and uh, but it's all part of Monticello the umbrella of Monticello and and um, plant preservation, garden history, and interpretation. So I was there for 17 years before coming back to Monticello as in my current position. Um, but as you said in the introduction, I do give lectures. So I do um, a lot of uh, preparation for, for talks and, um, and writing articles and um, editing. Um, I do a lot, actually I do a lot of, of editing of our, our um, uh our publications as well as the catalog seed catalogs that go out and i even um spend time uh administering the uh, Monticello farm and garden facebook page and that's uh something that i enjoy doing um posting photographs of the garden and, and talking about different uh plant histories um and just about every day we post on our 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 facebook page so um everyone's invited to join um it's um just say- Send a send a request, and we will happily uh, welcome you to our our, uh, our our group. And I do know that you also share on Instagram um, photos from the Monticello Garden. That's right. Yeah, we uh, we do have a lot of social media outlets at Monticello. And recently, we we've been doing live stream videos, um, and there was one of me recently. Um, well, about two months ago. Uh, it was an interview, um, and it's on. And you can still pull these up on our website. Um, the, the 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 live stream programming has been a lot of fun, and especially since we were closed for three months um, for 
from March uh, 15th until uh, the middle of June. And so we started doing a lot of um, uh, programming um, online, digital programming, and, and um, even live stream garden tours. Um, and I've done some private tours uh, 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 via uh, that that medium, and it's been it's been a lot of fun um, to have uh, groups that have signed up. You know, there'll be like you know, thirty, forty people on a uh, Zoom tour, and I'm walking around <laughs> talking to the to the camera, basically. Uh, so that's another uh, part of what I do, and um, yeah, it's every day is a little bit different, I think. Um, but uh, yeah. I imagine that's what keeps it interesting. Yes, it and the Heritage Harvest Festival that we had mentioned earlier takes place usually um, second weekend of September, usually obviously not conflicting with Labor Day weekend, but this year it's taking a break. Um, I assume to return next year, hopefully after the COVID crisis is over with. Yes, we're going to be offering a series of um, kind of a, a long series of, of um, programming that would have been offered on one day. Uh, at the Harvest Festival, and so there'll there'll be uh, a program with me and uh, Jennifer Jewell and Ira Wallace um, as one of the offerings. And um, she wrote a, a, a book recently about um, uh, women in gardening, the earth, the earth in her hands. And I'm featured in the book, which is quite an honor. <laughs> so we'll have a uh, um, an interview with us, but there'll also be speakers and workshops. And so the main thing is to, to go online and to get uh, reminders of these upcoming events. You can sign up for them or register for them. And uh, we, we may even, we're hoping to even be able to offer uh, some kind of virtual um, wreath workshop programming in the, later in the year. Um, our wreath workshops are one of our more popular events that take place at the end of November and early December. And and so since we probably won't be able to have any, any of that on site, um, uh, we, we, we're looking to come up with some ideas as, of offering um, a, a, a taped uh, tutorial and, and uh, ha instructing people on making wreaths um, uh, on their own at home. <laughs> but we've done the wreath workshops really for uh, at least um, 35 years. Um, that's been a, a very popular program. I was just going to say for our listeners, uh, Jennifer Jewell is the author of the book um, that you'd referred to. And Ira Wallace is with Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which is just down the road um, from Monticello and has a, a close tie with both the festival and Monticello, of course. Absolutely. Yes. And Ira is um, featured in the book as well. And she's um, ha always such an important part of our Heritage Harvest Festival. Uh, what, from the very beginning, she it was really her her idea to start this festival. So um, she's the the founding founding mother of it for many many reasons. And they should follow uh, Monticello on Facebook and also visit monticello.org would be the website. That's right. That's right. That, that'll lead you to a lot of a lot of fun things in the garden, um, and to keep keep in touch with what we're up to because. You know, we're staying quite busy and, and coming up with some really interesting ways of, of uh, connecting to people, in, maybe in better ways than we could before by um, using more of our um, digital resources, our um, technology for live streaming and that sort of thing. So um, um, in some ways, it's it's opened up an opportunity for us that um, we didn't have time to do before. And so now we're, we're um, we have the opportunity to do this. And I know that you were just involved in a live Zoom chat with other historic um, garden properties in our area, Gunston Hall and Mount Vernon, I think. That's right. Yeah, Dean, Dean Norton, who has been at Mount Vernon for 50 years. <laughs> uh, he's an old friend. And um, uh, Ryan Dostal from uh, Gunston Hall. Um, the three of us had a, a delightful conversation just last Friday. And I believe you can can look it up on the Gunston Hall um, website, and it's about a forty minute discussion. And we opened it up to questions, and we had a lot of chat questions coming in. And um, so, uh, and 
it, it really worked out quite well. I, I did it in, in my office at work. So um, you can see some my book bookcase behind my head. So <laughs> and uh, Dean was at Mount Vernon in his office and uh, we were all at our respective sites. So but we had uh, also included some slides uh, or images from our our, our our three sites to show some of the restoration work that has been ongoing over the years. And um, so um, um, I, I think people would find it quite, quite interesting to watch. Yeah. No, there's a Southern Garden History Association. Are you heavily involved in that? The Southern, Southern Garden History Society. That's right. In fact, we were, uh, it's an organization that's, um, you know, uh, all over uh, the uh, covers gardening all over the South, but um, people are members from all over the country. But uh, this past spring, we had to cancel the annual meeting, um, which was going to be at Mount Vernon. So it's going to be rescheduled for next April, and hopefully we'll be through this and we can we can have an on-site meeting again. But it's um, this organization has a publication called Magnolia, and I do a lot of uh, editing and work on that publication. And um, it, it, the website, um, which is southerngardenhistory.org, is a great resource for garden history, for research. Um, it's definitely worth a visit to um, uh, see all the various links. You can you can access all of the the journals uh, going back uh, to the night into the 1990s online, and you can uh, find out about uh, historic sites all over the South. But but it's an organization for for, for just um, uh, anyone who's interested in, in gardening and garden history, it's not just a professional organization at all. And um, it's a very social group. Um, and the annual meetings are, are one of the highlights of, of this organization. Yeah, I recalled them meeting in, at Monticello, I want to say almost 15 years ago previously, and being able to take part in that. And they are a very gregarious group and open to anybody list, you know, that's interested in the topic. So definitely check that out. Yeah, I thought last uh, we've been in you know, Nashville and, and, and New Orleans and Charleston and and uh, and all over the all uh, the, the meetings are held and focused in uh, different cities and towns um, every year. So definitely worth worth looking into. Thank you so much, Peggy Cornett. You've given our listeners many avenues to explore and check out online and those online talks and videos that are available and upcoming ones. And I hope that many of us will be able to get down to Monticello soon to visit in person, if not this year, then sometime next year. Yes, we're definitely open to the public and a lot of outside activities, of course. So yeah, it's definitely a good time to come. The, the gardens are, are looking tremendous right now. And we had a good spring, uh, cool weather and, and and regular rains. So um, it's really never looked better. So you, if you're in the area, uh, it's definitely worth a trip to Monticello. Wonderful. Thank you again, Peggy. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Plant Profile, Echinacea. The coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, is a perennial flower native to the open wooded areas in eastern and central North America. It is a favorite plant for pollinators from bees to butterflies. They are wonderful as cut flowers for arrangements and a great low maintenance choice for the landscape. Due to new breeding programs, Coneflowers have exploded in popularity with a diversity of flower colors, shapes, and sizes. The straight species is a rosy purple, but new cultivars now come in a wide choice of colors ranging from bright shades of orange and yellow, soft whites and greens, and brilliant hues of pinks and purples. The new selections also have unique flower forms, such as double petal flowers and more dwarf compact plants suitable for container gardens. A few selections I especially like include Green Envy, Cheyenne Spirit, and Pixie Meadow Bright. Echinacea prefer full sun and well-draining soil, but can tolerate part sun and clay soils. They will bloom from early summer through frost. Frequent deadheading, removing the spent blooms, will promote reblooming for your coneflowers. At the end of the growing season, leave some coneflowers up to go to seed, 
These provide food for birds and for native beneficial insects who spend the winter inside the hollow stems. It provides a cozy home. Gorilla gardening, planting seeds of hope in the community. Like mythical fairies, the group of young urban residents crept into an abandoned lot late at night and left flowers in their wake. They planted in parking lot edges and along median strips. They even filled in some potholes. Knowing that their deeds might be ephemeral and not last a full day, they still gathered and expended their time, energy, and resources in an effort to inspire similar deeds in their community. I accompanied these so-called guerrilla gardeners one evening in Washington, D.C. a few years ago and found them to be motivated by a number of different factors. Some were interested in gardening and had no space of their own. Others were living eco-friendly lifestyles and saw the plantings as a political statement against all the concrete and asphalt in our cities. Still others just saw the plantings as fun outings to participate in and like the thrill of a small amount of danger in doing something ostensibly forbidden. The practice has been around since our ancient ancestors took a violet or other wildflower from the woods and transplanted it next to their huts, enjoying the flower's beauty daily in their community. But it only gained a name a decade ago when groups of intrepid residents of New York City and London gathered for nighttime gardening installations at bare land around their city. Since then, guerrilla gardening has spread worldwide and even spawned an industry of making seed bombs, clay balls impregnated with annual flower seeds that can be thrown over the fences into abandoned lots. Most guerrilla gardening installations are ornamental plants though more and more are planting edibles and herbs. Often they include direct sowing sunflowers since this tough plant serves multiple purposes. Sunflowers are attractive and need little care. They also provide a food source for wildlife and humans alike. Further, they self sow and can return annually on their own once a patch is established. Finally, sunflowers can help the soil by removing harmful soil toxins, a process called phytoremediation. Gorilla gardeners know that their efforts may be stolen or destroyed, but they live for the notes of gratitude and the smiles on the face of passersby. If you are inspired to do some gorilla gardening of your own, here are a few tips to get you started. Scope out a neglected piece of land or empty planter boxes. Visit it at different seasons and times of day. See how the area is used or not. Choose a location to where you live or work and appoint yourself as guardian to start watching over it. Select plants that are tough and can withstand the living conditions at your location. Some suggestions include ground cover sedums, zonal geraniums, black eyed Susans, and juniper. Invite like minded friends to join in and schedule a planting project. Make small signs at the location and post on social media to let people know of your project. Keep the plants alive and looking good by regular watering and pruning and weeding. Once you start, you will see neglected land wherever you look. Empower yourself to reclaim these precious resources and cultivate them in our community. Before I share what's blooming in my garden this week, I wanted to thank a new listener supporter, Kevin R. McIntosh. Thanks so much for your support, Kevin. This past week, it's been rainy on and off and fairly gloomy in the mid-Atlantic, but we needed those rains, so I am definitely not complaining. And for sunshine, I have plenty of yellow blooms in my garden, from the really tall and formidable cup flower to Rubecchia liciniata, which is kind of a thin, tall plant. Um, it's also known as the green-headed coneflower or cutleaf coneflower. 
I got it actually from a construction site rescue mission where it was going to be torn out from an old police station in our neighborhood and I put it along my back fence line to spring up and sure enough it has so much so that I'm using fishing line to tie it back from leaning into the sidewalk and bopping passers-by in the head. Other spots of bright yellow in my garden of course include the state flower of Maryland, Black Eyed Susan. It's in discreet patches all over my garden and I keep moving it around. It keeps moving itself around. Um, every year it's a surprise sometimes where it shows up even into part shade conditions. And then goldenrod is just starting to color up. Uh, that'll last for at least the next month or so and makes a wonderful pollinator plant. And I love to have it mixed in in uh, cut flower bouquets. It makes a great filler. And then finally, there's sunflower. This year I seeded in a shorter variety that should get about three feet tall and it's just forming its flower buds. Um, past years I've done those giant sunflowers. I've also done the teddy bears and the filled in, but I like this mid-range sunflower. It gives you something at a nice height for passing by and makes a good cut flower as well. Hoping you have sunshine in your garden as well as plenty of rain. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener Magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.